Welcome to New York Bio's Virtual Breakfast Series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode features venture capitalist Armin Vidian. Hi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. We are very excited you're joining us for another edition of our Virtual Breakfast Series. Um, we are uh, very grateful that Armin is joining us today. We'll delve into all of his accomplishments and prognostications for the future um, in just a few minutes. Uh, but first, um, thank you so much to Avantour for sponsoring this month's series of breakfast. Um, we are grateful to have them as our partners um, for lab supplies um, for all of our member companies. Um, housekeeping. I know you're going to have questions for Armin as we go through the conversation with him. So please put your questions in the chat or the Q&A and Derek and I will get to those throughout the course of our conversation. Um, with that, I will kick it over to Derek um, to get us started. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Armin, wonderful to see you. Uh, you have the San Francisco Bridge in the background, but you are in New York today. So other right. than a background choice, it is lovely to have you. Uh, we get to talk about uh, all things data today, which is really, really interesting. I think over the last decade, there probably hasn't been uh, a, a bigger, I think, increase in the importance of a sing singular factor than how we use data and how we think about healthcare, therapeutic development, uh, and the industry in general. So we're excited to dive in. Um, as we usually go, why don't we start with an origin story and have you tell us a little bit about how you got where you are today? Sure. So um, while I know a lot of people say that where and who they grew up with is influential to them, to me, it's really true for some specific reasons. Um, I think my um, uh, modus operandi as an investor was very influenced by where I grew up. And in particular, um, from the investing perspective, uh, my father, um, who was a bank loan officer and vice president in a community bank in Southeast Wisconsin. I grew up in Racine, Wisconsin, midway between Milwaukee and Chicago. And so he would make loans to various small businesses. And at the time in the 70s, of course, absent the regulation of today, it felt a little bit more like small business venture capital, right? Yeah. So um, indeed, he would take me along to all the um, machining companies and lighting companies and all of these things that he would make loans to, I would tag along. And he loved entrepreneurs. He loved small businesses and what they did for the community. And I would visit their homes and so forth. So it was very much ingrained into me that it was highly valuable from a young age. Um, he himself was an entrepreneur and didn't really describe himself that way because he was kind of plucked out of obscurity um, from a small bank uh, by uh, the local um, uh, uh, consumer products goods magnate uh, named Sam Johnson, who was starting a bank. And so um, uh, Johnson Wax, now today SC Johnson, um, uh, its uh, CEO and founder, uh, Sam Johnson was starting a, a local bank there in Racine, and so somebody said you should go get this guy named Frank Vidian, which was interesting because <clears throat> Sam Johnson was highly educated himself with Cornell degrees. Um, my father didn't have an education at all, and so um, it's a little bit like, you know, Larry Ellison plucking a loan officer at a at a you know, <laughs> branch, but right, you know, oh my yeah. God, what lottery <laughs> did I win, right? You know, and sure enough, he sat my dad down in a trailer park home that was the um, uh, the temporary site for the bank, together with a uh, uh, the uh, president of the bank who had a Princeton degree, and I think that what was really influential to me was that <clears throat> watching how both worked together and belonged. Both of these very different backgrounds belonged as entrepreneurs with very different stories. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at companies and people and their backgrounds, that is the lens through which I look at. Them. And uh, as it has a very strong influence with me. Um, so I think that <clears throat> having two parents who didn't have a college education, while on one hand, uh, you would look at that as a disadvantage, to me, it was also a gift. Um, I learned that the world didn't know me and that 
while I didn't have that easy intellectual confidence that a lot of my friends in college wound up having, um, I also uh, learned to accept, you know, my vulnerability as a gift and to pursue things independently of expectation. And for the curious, that wound up being a tremendous strength. Um, at the same time, I would be lying to you if I didn't say that I also had the benefit of, of privilege. Um, in a small community in which education was very valued, um, I had the benefit of a great K through 12 uh, private school that was reasonably affordable. And we also placed a high value on not only STEM, but the arts and the integration between all of these things. And there were a lot of really uh, strong people from the community involved uh, collectively. And that was also a, a very positive influence. Um, so uh, that said, then I chose very different experiences and where it really started, data itself started becoming a very big influencer uh, in my career choices. Um, where when I went off to college, I went to MIT, which is a very different place from Southeast Wisconsin and exciting and vibrant and bright people every which way you look. That must have been a little bit of a culture shock. <laughs> Yeah. A little bit of a culture shock. And, you know, you at the same time, um, I found it really energizing. And, uh, you know, you're kind of struck in awe all the time where yeah. especially when you meet people who had far less than I ever did, who found their way to MIT or raised by single parents and not great schools. And wow, well, how did you get <laughs> the courage to find yourself here? Right. Um, and then there are, of course, those people who wind up being amazing at all things and, you know, a basketball star and coaching little kids on skiing on the side. And you say, okay, look, you know, you've won life. <laughs> but, you know, I just, <laughs> I'll just. Just going to crawl back into your. Uh, it's all you, you know? So uh, <laughs> like, I uh, just, just let that be, you know? Um, but, um, and at the same time too, having uh, parents who, had been successful on their own, but without a college education made me come in with a really unique perspective. Because when you think about it at a place like that, the only people with that kind of demographic background are generally people who are children of celebrities or athletes, right? That combination of things um, is, uh, is, is unusual. And so that gave me, a, again, another lens through which I see many different sides of things. Um, but, um, I, in, in coursework, I wound up taking this class that was perhaps the most influential one that I took there called organ transport systems. And you looked at organs in the body as engineering objects. So we looked at non-laminar flows in blood vessels. We modeled the heart as an electrical engineering object. Um, lungs and data that might influence breathing. Right. And this was in the early 90s. Right. Yeah. And, you know, MIT kind of pushing these boundaries on the side. Um, you know, it really was very obviously at the forefront of data and medicine. Right. And so this was extremely influential. And then graduating and not sure what I wanted to do and no plans other than, you know, celebratory dinner with my folks and then nothing, right? So I went off to graduate school and I went enrolled at a program at Stanford that looked really interesting. I thought I was gonna go continue studying uh, mechanical engineering, which was my undergraduate degree and mechanical engineering with some biology. And um, as soon as I got there, I saw this program that was really interesting and it kind of integrated data science, uh, psychology, um, economics. And I thought it was very, very interesting. Um, at the time, it was called engineering economic systems. It's now since evolved into something called management science, which I'm not quite sure is apropos either, but yeah. such are names. Yeah. And you would take a class called data and decisions, right? And there would be decision trees through which you would make uh, evaluate options and uh, go through Bayes' theorem, of course, right? So all of these sorts of things in understanding how it is that the decisions get made. And so uh, this continued to be really influential as I, as I pursued my education. It is really funny how a lot of times before the, the decisions that people make in going to grad school was because 
they thought something was interesting or cool and absolutely not like the three-dimensional chess matchup. I really think this is going to be useful for right. my future. It, it, it is funny how your, your educational tree sometimes comes down to what struck you as interesting that day on a, on a Saturday. It's the whole, you feel like you should go to grad school, but the options are almost infinite. And the way that people actually make those decisions are really kind of odd. It, the, the, the actual probabilities around those are very, very strange. And it's, you know, the irony here is you're talking about data and decision making, and you actually use no data whatsoever in the decision making to go after it. Isn't that the irony? I know. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. And as I even as I say that, right, I, and it's true, but you like to think, you know, oh, everybody's got the whole world all figured out, right? And that's even harder today in social media and everyone, you know, presenting themselves as something. No, you know, I it wasn't a structured decision mm -hmm. to go out and pursue what I did in graduate school. It just looked kind of cool, and that's what I thought I'd do. And having a um, having a teenager going through the college process right now, I can totally affirm that some things don't change. Right. <laughs> you know, right. you can get on campus and say just one little thing and you're like, oh, yeah, no, you know, but it's totally it's not rational. It's not data driven. Hmm. It's like a feeling. Right. And so, right. yeah, right. <laughs> that time should in one's life should be messy. Yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, for all these structural demands we place on on kids that age that's a really contrarian piece of advice to them. Right? It's odd. And and it's funny. You think about, you know, the social media influence and the whole bit. You you realize that the the background and all of the other things that go into your decision are very rarely replicated in other people who you might take advice from. You know, the lens that you get advice from anybody on careers or really anything else is usually through what they did, right? So most of the time people will tell you what they did and why they did it with the implied thing of you, you should go do this, or you could mm -hmm. do it this way, when most of the time that doesn't necessarily fit, right? You know, there's kind right. of archetypes that people think they would want to fit into, but, That's you know, you never really know. Um, so, you know, and, and, you know, here, we're going to watch, watch this transition, you know, and, and I think in their, in their late twenties, I think for a lot of reasons, everybody wants to be a venture capitalist, right? right. Because it sounds, it sounds interesting. It sounds cool. You get yep. to do, you get to work with early stage, you know, companies, there's the implication that you get paid a decent amount. So, you know, it's not like the risk of a startup and things like that. So, uh, you know, with that, why don't we talk about how you got into venture? <laughs> so uh, that's a very interesting question. So I actually had, um, I'd spent many years in, in product, um, in medical device startups and integrated pharmaceutical companies as well, um, learned the discipline of understanding line of sight to the customer and so on. Um, I, and I had been part of a lot of failed clinical trials, right? And, you know, you learn how hard it is to save a single life. So I actually started a company, um, which my prior firm, DCVC, had invested in. It was called Blue Talon, um, with the idea of making data access um, easier for disparate groups with different access rights in order to design a clinical trial that might make more sense and um, started the company, had door slammed in my face, the usual thing of, you know, when you're starting a company and then eventually find, helping find uh, the company's way. Um, eventually um, the company exited to Microsoft. Um, I had joined uh, shortly before that um, DCBC full-time, uh, my prior firm uh, as a partner. Um, and this was in the bottom of 2015. Okay. And um, as is often the case with a lot of people who enter into venture, it's through a startup through the vent that the venture firm invested in. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and this was early in uh, the lifetime of, of DCVC. Today, DCVC stands tall as a $3 billion AUM venture capital firm um, with deep tech at its core, um, investing in all kinds of industries. Um, and uh, at the time, we were a obviously very small firm. There were just a couple of us there. Gosh, I think it was uh, the two managing partners, a CFO and me and one other person. Yeah. And, you know, I think that what was so special about the time is that I really had the privilege of being given an open slate to show what could be different in a VC firm yeah. um, without bias about what it should be. And I like to think that that created something important. 
And I was really given the platform to bring my collective story of experiences, AKA the stuff I've just been talking about, um, to identify diligence and then help companies succeed um, either formally through a board seat or, or another means. Um, and I think that it was really, I, I didn't know if I would like venture or not. And it turned out I really did. Um, I love the different roles and contributions I would be able to help each company I found uh, be able uh, in lending my own personal experience. I loved the um, eclectic nature of different things to be curious about. And certainly venture is that uh, a great place to be curious um, so long as you're also returning returns to investors, which is what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think that eye on that ball is always really important. Um, and in these early days of tech meets bio, um, I was involved in identifying and supporting uh, a tremendous number of the of what are now some of the for, uh, front running companies in this space. And I'm proud of that. And I'm grateful for that opportunity. So, OK, let's let's dig in there a little bit. So it's 2015. And, you know, Tech Meets Bio isn't even necessarily a, a, a no, nobody would know what you're talking about. Nobody had the name. Not, not, a, not a name. So what are some of the things that crossed your desk that, um, that kind of weren't appreciated by uh, more traditional investors at the time? Uh, and if I rewind, that is kind of right in the middle of where immune oncology is ramping up. I forget the exact date on the phase two for, uh, for, for PD-1, but that's right around the time where you know, PD-1 and IO is about to get red hot. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, immunology companies left, right, and center. Uh, so what were some of the things that you were looking at that, you know, you thought were great, but like didn't necessarily fit in, did, didn't necessarily fit into the, the environment otherwise, or that other people didn't necessarily get? So I think a couple of things that come to mind immediately, um, two. So one, I think that the idea that a computer could find a drug um, with using a ton of data and then identifying it just with computers um, before you launch, went into in vitro experiments mm -hmm. was something that was so out of left field and that unless there were a bank of a molecular biologists backing that up, there were just a lot of people afraid to go near it. Mm -hmm. And I understand why, right? It, I think to a lot of people, it felt like, well, what biologist did you get to confirm that? Right. And, uh, you know, the truth is that a lot of the time wouldn't know because, you know, it goes back to how we were educated, right? Biology was over here. Computer science was over here. And there were not many people who had both to really understand what they were looking at either from one perspective or the other. Um, and so those were anything in that realm. Um, uh, and especially if they weren't already seasoned entrepreneurs, but it's considered enormously risky. Right. Those risks. Right. And it, even then, if you had, if you had the type of company that you're talking about, the likelihood that the subject matter expert would have been a seasoned entrepreneur in the healthcare space or otherwise is minimus, right? There's no way. Right. Precisely zero. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. the other thing that I think that um, at least on the tech side, investors stayed away from um, was anything with FDA in it. Oh, they hated it. They hated they, right. it. Was, it was anathema and, to anything that they would touch. Yeah, I think that it kind of it it's it doesn't appeal to kind of the I'll say left leaning libertarianism that. <laughs> you know, a lot in the space have of, well, the FDA is there to get in the way. And of course it is much more nuanced, nuanced than that. Yeah. And actually the right FDA pathway can be an enormous asset to your company. Yeah. It, um, it's ironic too. We, we think about this now because, you know, AI is, 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 is kind of everywhere. And there's the, the headline of, of, you know, what are we going to do with, with drugs that are discovered by AI? And the, the ironic part is that, well, we're, going to test them in humans in the same regulated way that we test all of the other drugs, however else we find them. It's funny, there, there's the entire discussion over regulation of AI, although probably the least, the last place it needs to be regulated is drug discovery, because we have the entire downstream mechanism to do that already. Right. 
Absolutely. So yeah, those were those were the two main ones that stick out at me. Okay. Um, so you know, it was you're right. Um, it made for an interesting environment, and there were a very limited number of us making these investments at that time. And okay. So today, you, you, you said before that this part might get contentious, so we can we can get contentious. Let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about uh, tech investors and biotech investors. Sure. Sure. Um, so at that time. It was a set of tech investors who I think were really making these bets in companies in this space. Mm -hmm. um, and that has expanded a little bit. I'll say I think there are more doing it um, in, on the life science side, but um, definitely more. But I wouldn't say it is a seamless integration between um, bio funds and tech funds both doing it. You know, I don't think they as easily talk to one another about these companies as would be ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, the overlap isn't zero anymore, but it's it's not perhaps what an ideal environment would make. Yeah. Do you think it's because they still generally, if they're a tech investor or a bio investor, they they look at the world differently? I mean, why do you why do you think there's I do, think lower it, uptake, yeah. I do think it's some of that. So I think if you take a look at the risk profiles of investors in bio and tech, you kind of get two different things. Bio investors are used to taking a ton of, say, clinical uh, trial or biological risk. They take those, they do that every day, right? Now, sometimes that can be reflected in valuations and so forth, and that's another discussion, but that is kind of their bread and butter. Business model risk is not where they take much risk. Right. right. Just you really don't see that. Tech investors, it's the other way around. They take risk on business models every day, right? How are we going to figure out where the market is for this? Well, we're going to figure out a go to market exercise, figure out exactly precisely how we're going to nail it and then build a category from there. And then, you know, that's how it's going to work. That makes, you know, bio investors turn their head and say, what are you thinking? But things like, as I was mentioning before, clinical trial risk, that's that's pretty anathema. Mm -hmm. So in the in the tech world, so I think that now when you're trying to bring both together, it, it, and they're just used to very different risk profile, it's a little bit hard to do. Yeah, you know, I think early it, it's interesting. I think there were one of the big things that I think influences too. I think there was a split initially, and I think one of the things that influenced it is that prior to say 2015 in the in the early you know 2010s before teens, one of the one of the kind of you know major investor vehicles was kind of the single asset uh, company, right? And this this was kind of born out of the you know the the deep trough you know difficult times of two thousand and eight. So you got these investors that were very very comfortable with the model of how do we get really confident in a single asset? How do we make this bet that is very heavy on biology? And really doesn't have any other bells and whistles. Like we understand the thing that we're betting on. It's this asset. It's this team to get them through clinicals. And that's what we're going to do. And then the, you know, the, from the tech side, there were, there was more of this appetite for, you know, things like, you know, platforms that could produce a lot of molecules the, the, to basically, you know, increase the funnel at the top. And, you know, on one hand, you had bio guys that were, basically building everything towards one big deal. And on this other side, you had things that were predicated on doing lots of deals, which actually in practice is very, very hard, right? right. And in the middle, you got to the point where the later stage guys and the public guys more or less gravitate to valuing a company by their, by their lead asset anyway, That's right? right? So you kind of, you get this confluence, but there's actually more of this kind of learning curve on the tech side. And I guess, the contentious piece and what kind of, I'll say it rubbed me the wrong way. You, there were pieces of that model where people would kind of celebrate the tech side in this massive piece of the innovation and say things like, this is going to revolutionize how yeah. you know, drug discovered when it's like, well, you do have like the other 90% of the work. Mm -hmm. This isn't mm -hmm. going to touch, mm -hmm. but you know, the pom-poms had to come out and we had to talk about how great it was. So that was the thing that rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. Yeah. Um, That's so I, I can totally understand that. Um, so back to the part about, you know, yeah. experience with clinical trials and, you know, more failures than I care to admit. Saving a single life 
is hard. And I think that if there's anything in the, in the tech community that um, perhaps was underestimated, it's, it's that that challenge of biology, right? It isn't, you know, you know, write a few lines of code. So that's the, that definitely is something that I think rubbed the bio community a little bit the wrong way. And it's understandable. Yeah, only ever, only ever so slightly. So where, do we, so so where do we sit now? Because I think the, I think the, I, I, I would, I would, there are there are a number of firms that have come way up that learning curve who you know started as tech firms and now whose healthcare teams are excellent. I, I'm, I'm sorry, can you broke up slightly the last? I did. I said basically, where do where do you see that we are now? Because I think there are a number of you know, things that started as tech firms who now have excellent, you know, healthcare teams or excellent kind of biotech investing teams. Yeah. So what we've seen is the first companies have successfully run through the proverbial wall and gotten bloodied. Mm -hmm. And we have seen them come for the, let's say, tech centric teams have successfully integrated biological scientists into those teams to bring a forward to the, uh, bring a drug forward to the clinic. The significance of that cannot be understated, uh, overstated, because um, it, the idea of using machine vision, such as recursion pharmaceuticals did, mm -hmm. to then get an asset forward, or Abcellera's um, COVID therapeutic, in the breathtaking, breathtakingly fast amount of time that they did, right, um, yeah. is is enormous. Um, I, I probably should pause to say that I remember speaking at a, um, a conference in Chicago and saying that we need to figure out ways to riddle drug discovery down from years into months. And people laugh, not with me, but at me. <laughs> and yeah, and then the next year was the pandemic. And Abcellera from the time, the top of the year until it was, we were inking their contract. Um, with big pharma to the time they got the first uh, patient's dose was three months. And part of that is will, right, of the pandemic. Yes. Yep. Part yeah. of that yeah. is way. And the actual belief that, you know, a really cool semiconductor chip, you can just uh, deposit, you know, activated B cells in there and get antibodies out of it uh, using technology was something that the significance of that cannot be overstated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we now have from those companies, people who have seen success and a little bit of failure along the way and understand the importance of the data itself, um, that not to overstate the importance of algorithms, um, who understand that they need to work with their biological scientist counterparts um, and in a way that matches to the science is something that we are now seeing in a second generation of entrepreneurs, which is why I believe that this space is just getting started. So if it's just getting started, what what is the right way, right, to advance it? So I think that, and this is my personal prognostication and opinion. Yes, the is, disclaimer. <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> you know, though perhaps not, um, it's not a crazy one, is that these companies will, we will continue to see more companies in this vein and more companies, um, uh, and more of the big pharma companies as well become full stack integrated software, hardware, and biological science companies. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be as easy for the big companies, um, though a lot of them know it and are working on that. Um, so I, I think that that is what we're gonna have to see in the future. Um, so I, I think that, that is a, a, that's a firm belief. And I think that um, one of the things, by the way, that very recently, um, has kind of put a, a foot forward in that is the critical uh, recursion pharmaceuticals NVIDIA partnership. Yes. Um, a little bit on that. So I think my personal opinion as reflected by, granted just a few days, the uh, uptick 
in recursion pharmaceutical stock price um, is that this may be the beginning of the public markets starting to understand what these companies really do and what they really are. Right. Um, and that they are not single asset drug companies defined by their first asset. Right. Um, I, I think that it's worth. You mind if I dive in for a little bit to perhaps? Yeah, yeah. No, we're yeah. we're just po we're just posting yeah, just the, the link to the to the Nvidia and and recursion. Oh, okay, great. In the yeah. chat now, so that everybody can see it. And I, for the, the edification of anybody that doesn't know, uh, Nvidia is a, is a you know chip maker that t makes GPUs. Uh, incredibly important for you know anything in involving video and video games, and now has been you know super important to the development of large language models and anything involving generative AI. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, so I I think that this is important. Again, um, I have no formal formal current role with the company, and I I'm giving you my perspective, but um, I think that a little bit of history is helpful. So. Yeah. In 2016, when I was taking a look at Recursion's Series A in a tiny lab in Utah mm -hmm. with a handful of people, um, there were really um, four of us around the table in that Series A taking a deep dive. Um, there was uh, Zavandar at Lux, mm -hmm. Nan Lee at Obvious Ventures. Um, and then uh, myself and my outstanding colleague, uh, James Hardiman at DCVC. It was a special time because, you know, each of the four of us came at this company from different perspectives, engineering, product, physics, machine learning, and even humanistic, right? And, and there was something special there. And I think that what we learned early on was that the goal of the company was really at building a definitive empirical map of systems biology, mm -hmm. an audacious goal, right? To build a relational database of uh, that characterizes human cells, disease, their interactions and so forth and compounds that influence that disease. Um, and as we know, they started with monogenic diseases to keep it simple right? Rare diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a handful of disease models, right? Um, and they extracted morphological features from cells as a means of characterizing disease and the response to various compounds. And it extracted an extremely high amount of data at low cost, mm -hmm. um, though they eventually have cross brought, brought on you know, other, other data sets as well. They they, le they leveled up, and the but in the beginning they did one thing that was super valuable, super low cost, and super. Fast. One thing, and when you look at a company, you look at something, pro somebody proving the one thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just prove the one thing. Um, Chris, who Chris Gibson, the CEO, who's an outstanding leader, and yeah. you meet him, and again another signal was, gosh, if I I'm not so happy doing what I'm doing, I just might just quit and go work for this guy. Right. Like it just that sort of I've met with him before and I agree, you know, right. yeah, it just he was able to bring together. You know, 20 something machine learning engineers from San Francisco and grizzled scientists from Chicago and Boston say come move to Salt Lake City and Salt Lake City is a wonderful place, but to get people with families to move to Salt Lake City and drop what they're doing and to believe in a company remember before yeah. I was saying that there weren't a lot of people who believed in this space right it was something right yes. and come yeah. come work at an extremely risky company with not a lot of capital doing a thing that hasn't been done before in a place where there's no other biotech companies and you have no parachute like a major like, it sounds like a life plan right yeah. so, <laughs> no, that's that's that sounds it's it sounds great i'm sure that everyone's spouse was excited by those terms that's right oh yeah exactly so but he also you know kept the eye on the ball that Again, saving a single life is hard. And, you know, if I remember, I think on my second or third visit there, he had pictures on the wall of people with, with rare diseases. Yeah. And yep. it kept you in line with no matter what small technical problem you were working on, I am the prize. Yes. Right? right. And it was just inspiring to be there. Right. So I, I think that 
Now you fast forward to today, right? And now we're getting towards NVIDIA uh, yeah. and the world of generative AI, right? And so, which we've all learned um, is uh, a response to a prompt, right? And uh, so in this case, it applies unsupervised learning to a data set. Now those data sets can be things that we understand intuitively like text, right? So combing text and then producing an answer from it. Okay, I get that. But data sets can also be images, right? Ultrasound, MRI, cells, cell bodies, right? All kinds of those data sets too. And they can be sequences of amino acids to produce protein structures, yeah. right? Now you have recursion, all grown up since the first time I saw them, right? And they have a lot of data, right? Um, I think they said they have something like 23 petabytes of data, 3 trillion relationships between genes and compounds. Think about that. And for just a pause button on that, a petabyte is something like 20 million file cabinets. They have 23 of those. So almost half a billion file cabinets of data. I mean, think about the lab experiments that we might have done when we were in school. Yeah. Right. So now to process all of this data and to train models against it and to predict protein structures from that, you need a supercomputer. And that's where NVIDIA comes in. Okay. Right. And where okay. this is so interesting is that, you know, especially the timing of it, you know, in light of what's going on with the AI and the attention around NVIDIA, and all of a sudden this announcement comes out and you say, oh, so, whoa, they're doing this over here. How does that apply? And again, that comes back to the reason why I give this context is if you go back to 2016, actually, they've been doing this all along. It's not a new bet, but the NVIDIA partnership puts booster rockets on that. Right. Yeah. Yes. So again, and, and the reason why I bring all of that, and, and by the way, they also have um, something called BioNemo, I think that's the name, um, that provides many different models for AI discovery, things like AlphaFold, um, mm -hmm. docking uh, models, and so forth. You can put all of these into that and run that in the cloud. So now that I tell you I have, you know, 23 petabytes of, of data on relationships between biological and chemical entities and so forth, um, and ways of trillions of ways of modeling disease. Now, let me ask you, what is the company I have? <laughs> right, right. Who, who's who's going to pay for whatever that is, right? Right. So you know, but meaning that I now have that enormous data set, right? And that itself, of all of these relationships between compounds of the way we understand life is now something that can be powered by NVIDIA, that recursion has put together painstakingly over many years in designing disease models and controlled experiments. And sure. it, it's just been, um, it's an enormous company that is well beyond much as it is important for those rare diseases and the other um, polygenic diseases that they found uh, that they're working on as well, it is well beyond one or two assets. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's interesting, and we so we didn't have this have this part of the discussion before, but I think it's well worth bringing up, right? So ours is an industry where um, small shifts can result in uh, very big players. So I think I think one of the best examples is. Um, you know, Gilead's acquisition of Pharmacet, $11 billion uh, uh, in acquisition costs, basically added uh, the market capitalization of Celgene onto Gilead's already, uh, you know, Gilead was, was I think, about $74 billion in market cap at the time, and they ended up being, you know, one of the largest players in, in immunology. So I, I think there are places where shifts in our understanding of biology and, and being better at treating certain things can create powers in the industry that are, you know, that weren't there five years ago. And it's interesting to think about this now because much of what we do as an industry, I would, I would almost, you know, posit all of it hinges on small steps forward in our understanding of biology, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think part of the promise here is that the, the landscape in the future is, is never really fixed. And, you know, you can have these kind of emergent forces that 
you know, do show you kind of outsized, uh, outsized gains. And ultimately, really the best thing about this is whenever this happens, there is usually a group of patients at the center of it that, that benefit uh, in, in ways that they didn't before, which is really the yep. best part. That's right. Um, go ahead, Jennifer, I think you got a question? No, it's okay, go ahead. No. Um, I, I'd say the same, by the way, analogous story for Epsilera, um, as with recursion again, Whenever I I talk about Abcellera, I, I feel like saying, you know, every, repeat after me, it is not a COVID therapeutics company. Um, <laughs> those have been amazing COVID therapeutics that saved lives, no doubt, during the pandemic. Um, so I remember I first saw that company in 2016 via um, renowned Stanford scientist, Steve Quake, um, who, by the way, is mentioning those people before who won life. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's one of those people who's won life. <laughs> so case in point, I rest my case. Um, yeah. So, um, but, uh, you know, the CEO, Carl Hansen, um, was a postdoc student of Steve's. And he had this incredible chip, semiconductor chip, in which you could deposit millions of activated B cells, they secrete antibodies, which makes for um, natural antibody discovery against really challenging targets mm -hmm. suddenly in the realm of the possible. And when you think about alternatives like hybridomas, you know, giving a mouse cancer and watching it squeeze out antibodies, the efficiency and suddenly now the throughput that you can get is mind blowing. Um, and, you know, again, it was a special time. Um, I dragged a colleague up to Vancouver and I said, I, you got to take a look at this. And besides, there's a really great a French restaurant I love, uh, love up in Vancouver. Let's yeah, Vancouver is really nice. Like Vancouver is not a difficult place to drag people to. Okay, yeah, granted, <laughs> okay, okay, it's not the hardest sell. <laughs> right, right. You know, I would go to Vancouver with you. That's not a hard sell. No problem, let's go. Right, Especially so, this time of year. <laughs> yeah, really. Touche, right? <laughs> we never made it to the French restaurant because we love the company so much. Um, and again, the leadership that Carl Hansen, uh, Veronique Lecole, uh, Kevin Hayes and Marie McCutcheon showed in just bringing together people from disparate disciplines to create that company and have respect for them as equals, meaning between the, the, the computational and the, uh, uh, the biological realms was just, uh, it was just groundbreaking. And then ultimately they partnered, uh, as is known with Eli Lilly for, um, uh, for that COVID therapeutic and it wound up being one of the two on the market. Yeah. It's interesting. And in, in a lot of ways, you know, there's the, there's the trope of, of, you know, can you do things better, faster and cheaper, right? And, and yep. you can apply it about virtually any, any industry and in some ways faster, usually it gets a little bit of a foothold first, but I think our industry is, is eventually pretty good at figuring out better. Yep. And when things are better, the industry gets genuinely interested in them. Yep. So as we, um, we've had a couple of questions from the audience and um, not, so, not unsurprisingly, Maria Gotch has a question um, about what are the key assets that New York City um, has or needs to become a leader in this sort of intersection, right, between tech and bio. And then she followed that up with, um, with the computational talent that we already have existing within Wall Street and our finance firms help, right? How does that play in? You bet. Um, I love New York for tech meets bio. I love New York, period. Um, but I think that uh, the time is right for that. We've already seen groundbreaking companies um, come out of New York. Um, and, you know, so I think it has now the technical talent, um, computational talent, and just a very dynamic place to do business. And I think that it is no longer the case. Um, I'm dating myself, but when I came out of school about, you know, when, if you were in tech in New York, you were kind of somebody's long lost cousin, right? Like, oh, 
you know, Armin, he's doing some interesting stuff in technology. Let's have him over for dinner and make sure, see if he needs money. Is he okay. Right. <laughs> right. You know, like, that's oh, cute. Right. Let's get, let's get a warm cup of soup, shall we? Right. You know, right. <laughs> get, get him um, off, you know. And, you know, I, I think that San Francisco is always going to be a critical hub. But I love that I can come to New York and see companies that are just as interesting as well. And you have not to mention, uh, you know, some of the world's leading hospitals as well with tremendous volume. That's a big advantage is that a lot of the hospitals in and around New York City um, and even in other parts of the state see a tremendous number of patients. So you can get that real um, uh, feedback on, on patients. Yep. Um, it's not just numbers, but diversity. I it's mean, the, the, the actual distribution and the diversity we have in a patient that's population right. here, I would argue, is unparalleled. Yeah, that's right. It's not a homogenous data, uh, patient data set. So that's mm -hmm. really critical as well. Not by any, uh, and, and, you know, as the joke goes, it can also take as long to get across, uh, you know, to get across the <laughs> cabinet to, get, to get across some small country. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think that's, you know, one of, I think, the best things that uh, Jennifer has done with New York Bio is, is increasing the amount of, you know, patient-centric and patient-inclusive uh, content that the organization has, has put together. And now it's it's integrated in almost everything uh, New York Bio does. And it's and it's huge. It's, it's an absolutely fabulous, you know, angle of things. And I only think that's going to get bigger. I think the industry has realized how important patients are. I think you know, startups and, and, and the venture side has, has mostly realized that too. And I, I personally, I think that just puts New York in a very, very powerful position for whatever the future is going to hold. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I thank you for that work, Jennifer. And I think that is hundred percent correct. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting, you know, historically we had sort of dabbled in a very couple of discrete sort of policy issues, right. Working with patient organizations and then when I came, I was like, well, we really want to start looking at how patients fold in. And you've seen a lot more blurring of the lines, if you will, between patient advocacy foundations, investing in drugs, even being an NDA holder, right? So like, it's, it, I think it's, uh, it's beyond time, right? That patients had a more prominent voice in the treatments that they seek. Yep, absolutely. So you talked about, um, you briefly mentioned San Francisco and you clearly have the uh, Golden Gate Bridge right behind you. Um, so talk to us a little bit about sort of some of the challenges you've seen in San Francisco that may or may not be helping us in New York. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny. Um, I just got back from a uh, whirlwind business trip in, in Europe and wherever I go in the world, I'm always asked about what's going on in San Francisco. Um, and in the so what's going on in San Francisco? <laughs> it was in the 20, 23 years I've lived in San Francisco. Okay, dating myself again. I, I was all it was always wow, San Francisco. How do I get there? Like, oh, that must be great. And today it's much more what happened. Yeah. And you know, um, this is a complicated question. I would say that there yeah. are a few things. But I think one of them, if I were to say that there's going to be a positive coming out of this, is more engagement from the tech community with government. Right. Because typically, I would say a big difference from New York is that those who have been successful in the tech community in San Francisco are more politically apathetic, libertarian, and don't get engaged with running for office. We've seen some changes in that, and there are certainly exceptions. But generally speaking, they're not as involved. Yeah. Um, I mentioned where I grew up and where people, businessmen had challenges with the government. They ran for office. They you know, hunkered down, formed relationships with that. And I don't think that's has been as much of a habit. Now, Gary Tan um, and Grow SF, Gary Tan might single-handedly um, solve all of San Francisco's problems. I've now bestowed on him an enormous burden, but you know, <laughs> there are people, and I should point out who are demonstrating extraordinary leadership like Gary. Yeah. Um, but I think that's thing number one. I think that a tremendous, uh, some of the other things I should point out are also challenges in other major cities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not an exception in San Francisco. And that I would say, 
you know, it, you know, it it, it it can be exaggerated that we're alone in these problems, and that's not true. Um, but I would say that it boils down to things like policing and not really looking at it systematically, um, but rather just stopping prosecuting some crimes, right? Which only incentivizes others. Um, access to drugs, and you know, really looking at are we do making choices that protect both the drug user and people on the street and how it is that we are mixing, you know, some tough love with, you know, empathy for those who find drug addiction. And it seems to slant, slant in one direction. I think along with that housing, we managed to turn the city into a museum and not be aggressive enough on building in parts of the city where you can be. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, education. And this is something that I've noticed, it's very near and dear to my heart because I'm being in STEM, um, is, is true in other cities across the country, but <clears throat> kind of revising our take on education where we're, instead of raising the floor, we're lowering the ceiling. Yeah. And, you know, suddenly saying, well, let's abandon um, math education at all until a certain point until we achieve equity. And I think that is a tremendous mistake. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, in the particular San Francisco is we kind of governed by committee and, you know, it's not centralized and the mayor who is not really empowered with as much as she needs to be in order to get things done. So these yeah. are the constellation of things that San Francisco has embraced that we need to solve, but it will solve them. I think the hardest part is that whatever whatever solution you ultimately decide on, half the people are going to hate it, right? And there's going to be a very, regardless of what you pick, yep. um, you have to kind of pick something and, you know, go with it and try and make it work. But regardless of what you pick, there is there is 50% of, of people that think it's the absolute wrong thing to do and are very, very loudly going to claim that you are doing the wrong thing. So you kind of it's it's inescapable in some ways, but that's the and that's the hardest part of it, right? You have to make hard decisions and you have to do something that you think is going to work, knowing full well that whatever you do is going to be largely unpopular until, you know, hopefully knock on wood, it actually works and produces results, which you don't know if it's going to do anyway. It's it's really, it's really, really yeah. difficult. That's right. And don't you think we're seeing, I mean, part of what we're seeing now is this sort of inaction, right? It's the sort of trying to take a sort of a middle softer road and maybe it didn't it, it didn't pan out like maybe the policymakers thought. Yeah. 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 No, I would agree. Um, now to be fair, San Francisco quickly activated. Um, as you know, um, we had a recall of our school board, um, yeah. our district attorney, you know, and those are those are pretty rare events. Um, you know, but um we need to look at really taking a, a comprehensive approach of, you know, if you're going to be doing drugs and you're not accepting treatment, then maybe, you know, prison is a safer face, place for you than the street, you know, yeah. and for others, you know. So I, I think that, you know, some of these policies had heart in the right, right place, but mind in the wrong place. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And also, while we're not certainly going to solve um, these problems today, um, one thing that I think is important is the right the impact of policymakers and their decisions. And what we've seen in New York, not from the social side, but from the business side, is that the state and the New York City government, economic development, have um, have really invested in building our life sciences community. Sort of kind of bring yeah. it back, you know, into um, yeah. into the business side. Um, and that's I mean that's helped tremendously for us to recruit companies, for companies to stay here when they get funding. Um, and I think we I think we graduate more PhDs in the region, right, than any anywhere else sort of anywhere. in the world. So we've been successful um, in creating opportunities, right, for them to stay here. And that's, that's, that's what's been so wonderful about what New York is doing. Um, it is embracing the best of the business community to solve real problems in health that we have. And that's why it's, so critically important. Um, and uh, that is the right approach. But making enemies of each other is just the wrong thing. And it's not what our country's about, frankly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're welcome. 
in New York anytime. <laughs> oh, <thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I'll see you in the airport in San yeah, Francisco right. on Saturday. Right. Days, right. You know? To be to be fair, I mean the the new LaGuardia is quite nice. It is. Um, you know, not it's it's not a bad place to hang out, and it's and it's closer than Kennedy. I mean, listen, you know, we the other thing to think about here is you know your you just you just came back from Europe. I think there is a significant uh, advantage to New York in terms of a, a New York Euro European connection. We're seeing more of that actually. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but you know, honestly, in terms of you know other things that have started to take root here, we do have a lot of, if not European companies, we do have kind of like their BD arms or their CFOs or whatever they're here, and there's kind of this natural connection between the city and 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 you know, in Europe. Absolutely. So, you know, ultimately, I, I think if we've learned nothing over the last however long, it's that good, good innovation can come from anywhere and right. establishing those connections and allowing them to thrive is a great way for them to, you know, get out one way or another. Good innovation can come from anywhere. And now New York has established that you can grow those ideas in New York too. Yeah. And so that's, what's so important. Yeah. Is having a place for them to, to be fastered and, you know, plug for New York bio is that we obviously try to provide opportunities for networking and connections and programming and those sort of um, community building activities, right? To make it, to make it even easier, right? For companies here. Um, so we've got time for one more question for Armin. Derek, you can add, I'll give well, you the, we have, the okay. last question. We have, we have three minutes left. And in the last three minutes, um, I want you to surprise us. I want to know what the what you've seen over the next over the last six months that you think has the potential to be the next recursion, if you will. You don't have to name the company. Just talk about the coolest idea you've seen and give us all a little bit of. So of a we've covered a lot of on the pharmaceutical side. Um, Something else that I wanted to touch on that I'd seen that I think is important is on the hospital side of MA mm -hmm. uh, as well. I think that one thing that if you take a look at something tech companies are really good at, it's um, creating a seamless and beautiful even experience for their products. Mm -hmm. right? You want to use them. You're excited about using them. Step into any hospital OR and you see a lot of technology, but you're pretty certain that Apple didn't have its hand there. Right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Johnny Ivy did not design the OR. <laughs> that's that's right. You know, and so, <laughs> but there's a lot and you take a look and there are machines everywhere. It's crowding the room. Yet yeah. the the surgeon and, and the nurses are crowded around the patient like this, craning their neck up, looking left and right, down, around. <laughs> and that's not the experience for the patient or the physician that we should be having. And there are surgical companies coming out now that make me so excited because those experiences are going to provide wonderful outcomes, I believe, for patients. And they're going to make, they're going to put a lot of joy into the experience of using them. Now, I mean, joy and having surgery are not often two things we associate together. But if it is a seamless experience for those, uh, for those physicians, it's likelier to be a seamless experience for the patient. Yeah. And when we've got to think about technology in terms of not just its clinical outcome, but providing those right health economic benefits um, and providing the experience that is valuable for everyone using. Um, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for your insights and, um, and the discussion today. I thought it was great. Um, so everybody, fun. yeah, has a good Tuesday and we'll see you later. Stay Thanks. cool out there, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.